This one. Everybody ready? Can I start? Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to get started at this moment. Until all things are in readiness, so we're going to get um, on the way. And we thank you for your patience. So, Dr. Tom, Deputy Dean for the UWI, and Professor Minerva Thain, who is, sorry, did I say Dean Tomlin? I must be sleep deprived. Sorry, Deputy Principal, UWI. My apologies. You see, I was thinking about Minerva, because I was about to say Professor Minerva Thain, Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences, the UWI. Professor Emeritus, Professor Rainford Wilkes, former director of the Epidemiology Research Unit. Professor Marshall Toller Reed, the director of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research. Professor Trevor Ferguson, professor of epidemiology and internal medicine and director of the Epidemiology Research Unit, what I call the reason for this season why we are here. The family of Professor Trevor Ferguson, distinguished senior staff of our university community, the staff of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research. Where are you, care people? Where are you? OK, yes, we thank you. Very good. Lecturers, hospital consultants, postgraduate students, medical students, nursing staff and students, other members of the FMS, alumni, members of the public, and well-wishers, and also to everyone who is on the live stream. Good evening and a special welcome to everyone. And I am Michael Boyne, and it is my distinct honor to be the chairperson for another wonderful occasion the inaugural professorial lecture of Professor Trevor Ferguson. I was chairing another inaugural professorial lecture just several months ago for Professor Marshall Tuller-Reed. And as payment for my many sins, I am back here again. But this is a special occasion. And Dean Thame, I don't think the UWI has ever had two inaugural professorial lectures in the same year from two professors of epidemiology, much less to also have a professor emeritus of epidemiology also in attendance. And I think that's truly remarkable and deserves a round of applause, especially <laughs> in the 75th anniversary of the UWI. Now, at the last inaugural professor lecture, what we call IPLs. IPLs are very significant. And Professor Wilkes, it is not the Indian Premier League that is IPL, inaugural professor lecture. Just making sure, because Professor Wilkes is a serious cricket fan. If you've been to his office, you will know. You'll see the pictures. But an IPL is said to be an important occasion for any university to acknowledge the appointment of or promotion of new full professors, to introduce them to the academic and the non-academic community of the university, and to provide the opportunity for engagement within the greater community. That was a quotation. And it is a key milestone in any academic's career, as they are going to now present all of their work, or maybe not all, a lot of their work firsthand so that we understand as a community what value they have added to our understanding of the world and how to improve it. And it is the journey that these professors had also to walk to reach this pinnacle. And I think for the university, such as the UWI in its 75th year, um, principal, deputy principal and dean, you know, it is a 75th anniversary. I'm trying to keep the theme going. Um, it continues our long history of academic excellence as we honor exceptional individuals. 
Now, some people, when I was asking a few people before, why do you think some people become professors? And they think that is because they are innate geniuses. And some are truly brilliant and gifted. We heard just last week from our Chancellor Emeritus, Sir George Alain, at the Professor Barry Hanshud Memorial Lecture, another example of brilliance. But it is more true that professors are made from 90% perspiration and 10% inspiration. There's some amount of luck, and there's also been mentored until they become experts in their fields and teachers of the highest rank. Now, anyone who knows Trevor Ferguson, sitting right here in the front, knows that he's a bright man. But more importantly, we know he's extraordinarily hardworking. You know, I was thinking about this, and I realized that when I met Trevor 21 years ago, Trevor, when we were, when we were working together on endocrinology, and to his credit, in those days, he aspired to do endocrinology. Matter of fact, I think he and another resident went with me to a conference in San Francisco on diabetes and endocrinology. That was June 2022, 20, sorry, June 2002. But after he attained his DM in 2004, he joined the epidemiology research unit. He abandoned the higher and sweet science of endocrinology for cardiovascular epidemiology. Well, because I'm a gentle and forgiving man, and since he's worked with Professor Wilkes, a man whom I, I admire greatly, the director then of the ERU, Trevor was in great hands, and he was working, as we said, about cardiovascular risk factors. So all is forgiven, Trevor. And Trevor went to excel in his new love, obtaining further formal postgraduate training, experience, and he focused on hypertension, his preferred area, just like Gerald Grell and Rainford Wilkes. However, I'm going to tell you all a secret. We endocrinologists regard hypertension as an endocrine disease. It has tight links with insulin resistance, endothelin as a hormone, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. It's all endocrine. So Trevor, you're an endocrinologist. <laughs> you know, someone once said, if the facts don't fit the theory, change the facts. So that's what I'm just doing right now. But Trevor has succeeded like everyone has expected. And he had the right attributes, hardworking, always busy, mentoring others, long ward rounds. That's characteristic of many professors like Rolf Richards, right, Professor Thame? Right. So we know Trevor also, have, also has many memorable personal characteristics. Friendly, inclusive, charitable, very spiritual. So we, as a UWI community, join with him in his achievements, and we congratulate you today, Trevor. So after all of my meanderings and musings now, we need to hear from somebody who should not need any introduction, as he's one of our own, Dean Tomlin Paul, as we knew him then. But now we know him as Dr. Tomlin Paul, who is after a brief sojourn in Africa, is now our deputy principal. And he also brings greetings on behalf of Professor Denzel Williams, our, our Mona principal, who unfortunately could not be here today. So, Dr. Paul, welcome. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, Professor Boyne. Professor Trevor Ferguson, our distinguished inaugural professor. Professor Minerva Thame, Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences. Emeritus Professor Rainford Wilkes, former head of the ERU. Professor Marshall Tullerid, director of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research. 
members of the UE family, faculty, students, members of the Ferguson family, Professor Ferguson's family who are here with us, students, distinguished guests, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen. I wish everyone a very pleasant and heartfelt evening, good evening, and I'm deeply grateful and filled with excitement to be here this evening to celebrate with you the inauguration of our professor, Professor Trevor Ferguson. It is a distinct privilege to extend greetings to everyone, to each of you, on this important occasion of the inaugural professorial lecture that Professor Ferguson will bring to us. And indeed, as you heard from Prof. Boyne, Professor Ferguson is indeed, I would simply say, a scholar and a gentleman. Prof. Boyne spoke about the number of epidemiologists who are in our midst and the number of epidemiologists who have done professorial lectures in the last, in this year. And it, it really is a privilege to be surrounded by so many epidemiologists. But there is one thing I hear they say about good epidemiologists. They say good epidemiologists never die. They simply adjust for age. <laughs> I'm not sure if Prof. Wilkes is doing that, but he did share his age with me earlier. So that's, that's good for us, because we certainly value the contribution of our epidemiologist colleagues. So I bring these greetings not only as a representative of our esteemed campus, but also as one who, with the, our current administration, is an advocate for the pursuit of knowledge and academic excellence. This evening, we come together to celebrate the remarkable achievements of Professor Ferguson whose tireless dedication to his craft has undoubtedly left an indelible mark in many ways, in his field and his study of research, study and research, but also globally, he has a distinguished track record of achievement as a scientist. And indeed, I must say that his work has also been contributing to impacting policy and practice for us in Jamaica and the Caribbean and globally. It is also fitting that we celebrate at this time, as you heard, we are celebrating our 75th anniversary as a university. And I want to congratulate also CARE, Professor Tolerid, for taking the initiative to uh, put forward these inaugural lectures, and Dean Thame also in terms of leading this process from the Faculty of Medical Sciences. Allow me to convey the sincere regrets of our principal, Professor Denzel Williams, who, due to unavoidable circumstances, is not here, cannot be with us this evening. Nevertheless, he sends his regards and his congratulations, Professor Ferguson, and his best wishes. We move forward with that enthusiasm that Professor Williams has for this event, knowing that it symbolizes the very essence of what makes our university community so vibrant and inspiring. A professorial lecture is indeed the epitome of what university is about. And if Principal Williams were here himself, he would tell you that this is our core business that we are celebrating. Thought leadership, knowledge development, and the advancement of the academy as a place that is contributing to national human development. Professor Ferguson's lecture, titled Determinants of Blood Pressure Across the Course, Across the Life Course, Lessons from a Journey in Hypertension Research, that title tells you how much he enjoys what he does. I take a journey to Ocho Rios and Montego Bay, but he's taking a journey into the determinants of blood pressure across the life course. So we, are very, we look forward to hearing what this journey entails and how much scenery and landscape there is on this journey that he has had. I would like to thank each and every one of you for being here this evening. Family, friends, well-wishers, supporters, they say it takes a village uh, to support Professor Ferguson and for being part of this special evening. Your presence will add depth and meaning to this gathering, and your engagement will undoubtedly contribute to the success of this event. Once again, on behalf of the campus administration, congratulations, Professor Ferguson, and I wish us all an enjoyable lecture. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paul. And uh, well said. And now we're going to hear from our dean, our own Professor Minerva Thame. And I may, I have to say Professor Thame before you come here. You have the distinction for chairing a faculty board meeting that lasted one hour this afternoon. One hour. And I think that accomplishment is confirmation of your preeminent leadership abilities. Welcome. We we'll await to hear your comments. <laughs> Thank you very much. But then when you have the principal going to speak within a certain time, you have to do what you have to do. But I think we got through what we needed to do. The agenda was finished. <laughs> so good, good evening, Chair, Professor Michael Boyne, Deputy Principal, Tomlin Paul, Professor Wilkes, previous director of ERU, our present director of ERU, Professor Tolerid, colleagues in the room, colleagues on Zoom, students, friends, and the family of Professor Trevor Ferguson. Good afternoon. But it really gives me great pleasure to stand here and to welcome you all to this lecture. After COVID, it dawned on me that our professorial lecturers had sort of fallen at the wayside. And uh, this was something that I thought we needed to address. So I quickly started calling around different persons, asking them if they would do their lectures, which they had not done. So sometimes I don't know if I should call it inaugural, because you're given so many lecturers before this. And we do have persons, such as Prof. Boyne, who wants to do his lecture, but um, I don't know if I can call it inaugural. So we call them professorial lecturers. But they're very important lectures, as Prof. Boyne has said, because professors must profess. We need to hear from our professors. We need to hear the work that they have done. You have worked very hard, and we heard that you're a hard-working man. And I know that because I've been in the, well, it wasn't care then, it was the MRI. So I know how hard you work. But I think it is important that we share the work that we do so people recognize you for the work that you do. When it sits in a journal, not all of us are going to be reading the journal, but certainly when you stand in front of us and you speak to us, we're going to remember this lecture. I almost guarantee that. We, cel <clears throat> we celebrate our 75th anniversary. And as a university, we started on the Mona campus. We started with 33 medical students, as you know. And I'm going to give you a secret. I just found this out. Do you know that those 33 names are actually, you know that um, pole, the, the flag pole that's by where the Senate building is? Those little boxes that you see around the flag pole actually houses the names of each of those 33 students that started. So I didn't know that. I don't know if you did, but I thought I, it was very interesting when I was doing a tour to share that. As we celebrate our 75th year, this is one of the things we wanted to bring back. And hence, we have started this series of lectures. And we have quite a nice lineup into next year. And of course, it will continue, hopefully. The Faculty of Medical Sciences, and we work very closely with CARE. And we like to know, I think we have adopted you, and you're one. We are one, just one have produced probably the most, not pr probably, you have produced the most pro professors within the university. And for that, we are very proud. Our professors have gone both locally and internationally. As you know, we heard from Sir George just um, last week. And there are many professors that have made us proud all over the world. So we are a proud faculty. We look forward. Professor Ferguson, to hearing your lecture this afternoon. It holds a special place in my heart because, as you know, I link blood pressure and changes to interuterine life. So I look forward to hearing your lecture. And I am sure all of us here are looking forward to hearing your lecture. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Um, and also, as we've been alluding to, um, the support that Trevor's also been receiving. And I think that 
behind every great man, there's a great family. And so I just again want to acknowledge your family members who are here. And I don't know if you might permit us, if you would just stand so we could acknowledge and also thank you for lending us Professor Trevor Ferguson. Um, but for the family members of Trevor, <laughs> welcome and, and thank you very much. And at times we've also lent Trevor to the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And in that way, even though it's not on your program, we, I'd like to welcome Dr. Nadine Williams, operating well, one of our own again. Um, so she'll be speaking from the office of the CMO, right? And uh, you'll be also bringing some greetings on behalf of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Dr. Williams. Good afternoon, everyone. It is really a pleasure, an honor and privilege to be able to have gotten an opportunity to say, to say the words, Professor Trevor Ferguson. It has such a ring to it. And I am very pleased to be here today. It's a very special day. And it is with a sense of celebration and humility that I am able to say how pleased and proud I am of this young man. We share the same birthday. <laughs> years apart, of course, years apart. And I really am very, very proud of uh, Professor Ferguson on this, his inaugural lecture, professor, professorial lecture. The Ministry of Health is very pleased and proud that you're a partner. Professor Ferguson has been the chair of the National Committee for Non-Communicable Diseases since 2021. And he has provided such guidance for the management of, yes, hypertension, but the other NCDs. And so, Professor, every time you stand, every time you speak, every time you analyze the evidence and you show us the path that we should go, we're very happy that you are at the lead of this very, very special uh, committee and in this very special place. So I will consider it a privilege to be here to say on behalf of the Ministry of Health and Wellness, even as I cover the desk of the Chief Medical Officer, she'll be back next week, I, I do say that the Ministry of Health um, congratulates you and celebrates you and um, all the very best in your professorial life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Williams. And at this point, we're now going to hear from <laughs> the cricket-loving chairman of the Bishop Gibson Relays, editor-in-chief of the West Indian Medical Journal, the Kingston College promoting, <laughs> that's why he's wearing the purple, Professor Emeritus of Epidemiology, Professor Rainford Wilkes, will give special remarks concerning his mentee, Professor Ferguson. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I really dislike holding the mic, <laughs> but nevertheless, it's a privilege to be here. Um, I wish the room was full to capacity, but that room seems to be full. So, and I'd like to, whatever I say, um, if I neglect to mention the online audience, I'd like for you to take it for granted that it is so. So, Mr. Chairman, um, thank you. Dr. Tomlin Paul, Deputy Principal, Mona Campus, the UWI. Professor Minerva Thame, University Dean, Faculty of Medical Sciences, as well as Dean of the Mona Campus. Professor Marshall Tuller Reed, Director of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research, formerly Tropical Medicine Research Institute. Professor Michael Boyne, in his academic capacity, apart from um, being chair, Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Other professors in the Faculty of Medical Sciences and across the University of the West Indies, Executive Management and Senior Management of the University of the West Indies, Executive and Senior Management of the Ministry of Health, Dr. Nadine Williams, um, 
I'm not, and I saw Dr. Andrean Grant earlier on, but also Chief Medical Officer Dr. Nadine Williams is in fact her substantive post is Principal Medical Officer, as I remember it, or is that an obsolete title? Distinguished lecturer, Professor Trevor Ferguson, and your family, Mr. Trevor Ferguson Sr. and Mrs. Ferguson, Dr. Kishwana Salmon Ferguson, and your sons, I remember him as Sean, am I right? Yes, not too bad. And your daughter, who I hope is online from Canada, yes, she is, and uh, Trevor's sister, Nadine. Other distinguished guests, all members of the UWI community, ladies and gentlemen, it is a delight and a privilege for me to participate in this inaugural professorial lecture ceremony for Professor Trevor Ferguson, and I thank Professor Ferguson for this invitation. Young Trevor Ferguson arrived at the Mona campus of the UWI in 1990. After a distinguished career at the San Diego High School, including being a member of the victorious inter-schools debating team, captain of a victorious schools challenge quiz team, head boy and valedictorian in his final year, and exceptional performance in his exit exam, which earned him the award of the Jamaica Centenary Scholarship. On his arrival at these gates, the main question that faced the UWI was how this institution could enhance the career and maximize the potential of this obviously brilliant youngster. Well, we obviously succeeded resulting in us being here this afternoon. And it is my pleasure and privilege to provide some insight into how Trevor accelerated his ascent of the academic ladder, moving from research fellow in 2004 to an ad personam professorial, professorial chair in 2021. No doubt Professor Tuller Reed will outline and detail the academic accomplishments of Professor Ferguson. But it will come as no surprise that he negotiated medical school and internal medicine residency without difficulty. And my only surprise in looking at his curriculum vitae is that his MBBS was not awarded with honors because he earned honors in five of the nine subject areas, including one clinical and four preclinical subjects. It's never too late to correct an error. <laughs> I will begin the way I intend to end. Trevor Ferguson is the embodiment of the vision and ambition of many generations of academics in the UWI Faculty of Medical Sciences, and particularly in the Caribbean Institute for Health Research Care, formerly the Tropical Medicine Research Institute. He's the product of his own talents, as well as the still developing research enterprise, first enunciated by the late Professor George Miller in a paper commissioned by the Commonwealth Caribbean Medical Research Council in 1981. The CCMRC was a previous iteration of what we now know as the Caribbean Public Health Agency. Miller was one of a band of United Kingdom epidemiologists who pioneered the study of the chronic disease epidemic in the Caribbean and recognized that the region needed to produce its own cadre 
of scientists for research in health. Having identified the priority areas to include hypertension, diabetes mellitus, coronary heart disease, and rheumatic fever, Miller proposed that the promotion of clinical epidemiology was mandatory. In his words, clinical epidemiology could be promoted either for training of physicians within the departments as specialists in clinical epidemiology, or the creation of new posts in clinical epidemiology. He said further, the clinical epidemiologists should pursue postgraduate training in medicine <coughs> should be based in Jamaica, Trinidad, and Barbados, the other islands might think differently now, and should not confine their work to cardiovascular disease, as several other health burdens would benefit from increased research activity. He further proposed that the UWI be the center for the development of the specialty, and that, and here I quote again, career paths should be created to attract and develop young graduates who would then be provided with the support necessary for harmonious growth, development of research, teaching, and training in the specialty. It's 1981. Fast forward to the late 1990s with the Tropical Metabolism Research Unit and the sickle cell unit under threat of becoming defunct, as was the usual fate of United Kingdom-sponsored research units on the retirement of their respective directors. The vision and tenacity of Terence Forrester, professor of experimental medicine, is to be commended for his proposal that there be a creation of the above mentioned TMRI, Tropical Medicine Research Institute, amalgamating the TMRU, the sickle cell unit, as well as the, the recreation of the epidemiology research unit, ERU. And these would be later joined by the Sir George Aline Chronic Disease Research Center in Barbados. The UWI is to be commended for accepting this bold proposal to create a center of excellence with the required critical mass. And this was launched in October 1999. At that time, critical mass was a thing, as they say nowadays. Buzz phrases come and buzz phrases go, and no doubt there is a buzz phrase which has supplanted critical mass for today's jargon, but which probably has the same meaning. Critical mass is not only a number of persons, but should have the following features. It should be self-sustaining, able to compete and collaborate internationally, be able to generate surplus output. And the output can be not only scientific production, but policies, finance, but excess output to generate growth. The TMRI, no care, has embraced epidemiology as a basic science of health research and practice. The ERU within care has embraced the tenets of epidemiology exemplified by Kenneth Rothman, author of the authoritative text, Modern Epidemiology, who posited, and here I quote, the epidemiologist draws influence from clinical problems and clinical experience. And we should probably expand that to health problems and health experience. Many of his conclusions will be influenced by statistical manipulation of data, but the epidemiologist is neither a physician or a public health practitioner, nor a statistician. Rothman further stated that epidemiologists have achieved a separate identity, being either physician, 
public health practitioner, or statistician, or even all simultaneously, is not sufficient qualification for being an epidemiologist. What is sufficient is a theoretical understanding of the principles of epidemiologic research and the experience to apply them. This Center for Research Excellence, CARE, formerly TMRI, also embraces the philosophy enunciated by Professor Nicholas Day from Cambridge that an epidemiologist in the modern era should be highly computer literate, have a good grasp of statistical theory underlying epidemiology and, and the methods that derive from it, and possess advanced bibliographic skills. I put to you that Trevor is all of these and more. In keeping with the vision of George Miller and the other early protagonists, for example, Professor Alan Jackson, the Institute has developed a robust training program, or robust training programs in epidemiology and health research at the postgraduate diploma, the masters, and the doctoral levels. And its graduates over the last 19 years now populate the region in academia, in health policy, in regional and international health agencies, among others. The Institute has a fine record of training nutritionists for a much longer period. And the substantial synergy between nutrition and epidemiology has characterized much of the output and influence regionally of this uh, <clears throat> center of excellence. The Institute has forged important international collaborations and has attracted large and prestigious research grants with the appropriate outputs. I wish to make a special mention of Dr. Novi Younger Coleman, who has single-handedly provided the biostatistical leadership and training over many years. This, of course, is necessary to complement the development of this research enterprise and each researcher in that enterprise. This is the incubator in which Trevor Ferguson developed, and we are immeasurably proud of him. The road to research excellence and the creation of a robust, resilient, and internationally competitive research enterprise in care has not always been smooth. And we are some ways from the vision of our forebears. But products like Trevor Ferguson certainly encourage us, encourages us, or encourage us to stay the course. Our work and experience have provided certain evidence and insights that we believe are crucial to a successful research enterprise. And I will name several. This enterprise must, must generate thought leadership, arriving at viable and relevant research agenda, taking into consideration the UWI's obligation to help solve the region's health problems as well as cater to the interests and preferences of its faculty members. It must encourage and facilitate scholarship that develops a command of the relevant literature in a mutually challenging but respectful environment. It should encourage research scholarship in all activities, including pedagogy. pedagogy. Worthwhile research questions should be crystallized and developed into competitive grant proposal, which may, in the beginning, be quite modest. But the vision must never be lost. It would help that this, this enterprise develop themes and programs around these research agenda and research questions. The engagement of technology to enhance collaboration is highly recommended. It should seek to recruit and train staff with the required skills and competencies. 
it should seek to build teams, including junior faculty, fellows, and students. This may include colleagues outside of the department, outside of the faculty, and even outside of the university. And there are several examples of that within CARE. All seeking to enhance the skills, competence, and competitiveness of the team in order to tackle the questions being considered. It should target funding agencies, locally the URI, the National Head Fund, the Chase Fund, the private sector, internationally, NIH, the MRC UK, Welcome Trust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It must emphasize mentorship. It should create collegial and enabling environments, especially for young faculty, fellows, and students to feel safe as they make their errors while learning their trade. It must demonstrate an interest in the career paths of junior faculty, fellows, and students. It should efficiently execute projects including data management to create growth in resources, properly curated data sets for future exploitation, should dis disseminate its findings in a timely fashion, including publications in the scientific journals, but also in, a, in the advice to policymakers. In all its endeavors, it should aim to have a high impact, and this may be in the journals, but it may be in the impact of a policy in public health, in clinical practice, or wherever this is relevant. And it should seek after wide collaboration, especially to enhance competitiveness in the international grant funding market. It should become familiar with opportunities in the faculty. For example, how many within the Faculty of Medical Sciences, how many of us are aware of the opportunities provided by the collaboration with the State University of New York and other universities? Must actively engage with healthcare delivery policymakers. And it's, it's actually a gem to have the Ministry of Health um, here this afternoon. It demonstrates what we have tried to develop over the last several years. The Honorable Minister of Health, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the CMO, the PS, her deputies, should be partners with the research enterprise. It should actively participate in the development of the structure and system that support research including ethical oversight, administrative management, and financial management. And of course, it must support and participate in all opportunities to showcase the results of the research. Senior and experienced faculty must actively recruit and engage their juniors fellows and students with a firm eye on succession planning. Faculty leaders must seek to embrace ambitions beyond their own personal achievements and must enunciate visions beyond their own personal tenure. And so, oh dear Trevor, today we salute you. We're extremely proud of you. But the care and the university should be proud of itself. For having provided the environment that has enabled you to be a success. And if I might add a twist. Jamaica, I don't know how many know, people know this, Jamaica is sometimes referred to as a country of samples. I'm not sure everybody knows what that means. We're very good at samples. My hope is that Trevor is not just a sample, but that we will, in fact, develop an enterprise 
which will produce a production line of high quality researchers. Another phrase is this, this thing needs to be brought up to scale so that we can sit and collaborate with our international um, collaborators, forgive the repetition, as partners. And while you receive and absorb the well-deserved accolades today, we remind you of another well-known phrase, which I'm sure your parents and your teachers have told you. The only reward for good work is more work. We therefore ask that you embrace the responsibility and obligation to continue to expand and make more efficient the research enterprise from which you have emerged. On behalf of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research and all its forebears and prior members, we ask that you and your family accept our warmest and most sincere congratulations, as well as, as, well as our continued support. Well done. We look forward to hearing from you. So thank you very much, Professor Wilkes. You know, Rainford, I know you're a religious man. So, and after listening to you, I think that was a little bit of your, almost the epitome of your Sermon on the Mount, and the dispensation as the good Lord left and commanded his disciples to go forth into all the world and make disciples. And he appealed that his disciple of Trevor continues the good work. You got the charge, Trevor. Very good. All right. Thank you very much, Professor Wilkes. And uh, without further ado, we're also now going to have a formal introduction of the inaugural lecturer. And that's going to be done by Professor Marshall Tullereed, Director of the Caribbean Institute for Health Research. Professor Tullereed. Thank you very much, Professor Boyne. I'm going to say all protocols observed <laughs> so we can get into learning more about the man of the hour, Professor Trevor Ferguson. Um, so it is really my pleasure to, to have the opportunity to introduce him. And um, I want to start by just talking a little bit about a concept, the concept of the academic physician being referred to as an academic triple threat. And this is something that was very popular in the 1960s because this physician was expected to do a number of things. They're expected to produce original, to be original research and product, productive investigators. Um, they were to be inspired and inspiring teachers of medical students and residents. And, of course, they were also to be exemplary examples of clinical care. And I think we'd all agree that Professor Trevor Scottwell Ferguson would be considered one of the University of the West Indies academic triple threats, a very rare breed in this era of modern medicine. So let's talk a little bit about the man. A native of Spanish Town, St. Catherine, a place of historic significance, Trevor attended school with Prime Minister Andrew Hones until his passion for green and black led him to Monk Street <laughs> instead of St. John's Road. <laughs> and Trevor, while you might be too old to join that other school that uses green and black on Red Hills Road, <laughs> I understand there's another institution on Belmont Road that has no age limits. <laughs> So at St. Jago High School, Trevor demonstrated evidence of academic excellence and leadership. He was named valedictorian and served as the school's head boy from 1989 to 90. And some of you may even be old enough to remember seeing Trevor in that epic battle for the school's challenge quiz trophy between St. Jago High School and Calabar High School in 1990, which unfortunately resulted in another notch in Trevor's belt. <laughs> A centenary scholar, Professor Ferguson joined the UWI medical class of 1995, 
receiving honors in community medicine, biochemistry, physiology, pharmacology, and pathology and microbiology. He completed his internship at the Spanish Town Hospital in St. Catherine, and what better place than his hometown, and went on to join the DM Internal Medicine program at UWI Mono, serving as chief resident in the end of his training years. An invitation by Professor Rainford Wilkes, you just heard from, led to his joining the Epidemiology Research Unit of CARE, and in short order, Trevor set about completing formal training in epidemiology, obtaining his diploma and MSc in epidemiology from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and then later the PhD in epidemiology from the University of the West Indies. And then you heard about his career trajectory as he was appointed a lecturer in clinical epidemiology in 2009, senior lecturer in 2014, and, as you would expect, was elevated to the rank of professor in 2021. It was here in the Epidemiology Research Unit that his exponential journey in hypertension epidemiology began. <laughs> Not hypertension, so I'm giving something else to talk about. He produced the first report on prehypertension prevalence in Jamaica, and that earned him the inaugural David Picou Young Investigator Prize when he presented these findings at the 1995 Caribbean Health Research Council meeting. And while Professor Ferguson will speak about his journey in hypertension this evening, he's also contributed to many aspects of non-communicable disease research, including diabetes, cardiovascular disease, prostate cancer, and infectious diseases. He's investigated the role of social factors and early life influences on many of these conditions. And in addition to primary research papers, he has co-authored several clinical case reports, review papers, and evidence summaries. His research findings have been published in prestigious journals, including The Lancet, Nature, Nature Communications, and Plus One. And I'm happy to say that he has collaborated not only with members of the department in care, on these publications, but with medical students, graduate students, DM residents, and colleagues from the Department of Medicine, as well as the wider UWI academic community. And in, this is all in addition to his many um, interactions with local, other local, regional, and international investigators. He's a member of the editorial board and peer reviewer for many leading academic journals. Professor Ferguson is also a part of several international networks, and these would include the Bernard Lowen Scholars in Cardiovascular Health, that's based at Harvard University, the Global Diet and Physical Activity Network at the University of Cambridge, the NCD Risk Factor Collaboration that's led from the University of London, and the Relish Consortium. His work has been recognized with several awards, um, the most recent being the Principal's Award for Most Outstanding Researcher in the Faculty of Medical Sciences in 2020-21. Professor Ferguson has also been an investigator on projects funded by the Jamaica Ministry of Health and Wellness, the National Health Fund, the National Institutes of Health, the National Institute for Health Research, and the Bernard Lowen Foundation. In addition to internal medicine, Professor Ferguson teaches epidemiology and has supervised and examined students enrolled in CARE's graduate programs, including the MSc and MPhil PhD in epidemiology, nutrition, and the postgraduate diploma in health research and epidemiology, and extends this to other students in other graduate programs, the DM and clinical fellowship candidates. He's an active member of the academic community and has served on the Mona Ethics Committee He's currently the director of CARE's Epidemiology Research Unit. And one of the things that marks his leadership as coordinator of the MSc Epidemiology Program is that this degree has become a popular choice among persons who are interested in building careers in health research. Trevor currently serves as chair of the National Committee on NCDs, and you heard from Dr. Williams earlier. And he also chairs the Jamaica and Caribbean Regional Clinical Guidelines for Hypertension. He's an executive member of the Association of Consultant Physicians of Jamaica for almost 10 years. So there are many clinicians who would like to claim Professor Ferguson as one of their protégés. He's a well sought after internist among the 40 to 92 year old demographic. <laughs> and this includes many of my own family members, including one who was calling me last week because she was afraid she'd have missed his lecture today. 
<laughs> and um, some of those um, are here today. His systematic approach to patient care, the use of the best evidence in clinical decision making is well known. And of course, not surprisingly, for his clinical work, he became a fellow of the American College of Physicians in 2011 and a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians, Edinburgh, in 2019. Trevor extends his clinical care to members of the church community, assisting with numerous outreach clinics. He gives health talks on stress management, so prepare yourself to dust that off tomorrow, Trevor. <laughs> not just stress creation. Balancing physical and spiritual wellness men's health, cardiovascular disease, and of course, hypertension. So we're not surprised about that. For many years, however, Trevor traveled via the Flatbridge to Linstead St. Catherine, where he maintained an internal medicine practice at a time when access to internal medicine specialist care in that parish that nurtured him was limited. However, my, while many of you may know him for his clinical skills, they may not have had the privilege of seeing him in the pulpit, or better yet, hearing him on RJR on a Sunday evening. <laughs> and this evangelist, you yeah, may call him Brother Trevor, or I don't know if he should be Bishop Trevor <laughs> as well, is a very active and dedicated member of the Bethel United Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic and a member of the National Ministerial Council for his church. So in all his journeys, Trevor has been supported not only by his faith in God, but also by the love and devotion of his family, many of whom are here and have been acknowledged. Um, his parents and his sister are here in person, and I'm sure others are joining online, as well as the family of his own creation, Kesh, and their two children, Kristen and Sean. And I have to make special mention of Kesh, as she's the wind beneath his wings, and I sometimes run into her at La Shushan on a Sunday morning, getting his Sunday gleaner and making sure he has all the right ingredients to go with that special lunch, <laughs> nurturing body, soul, and spirit. <laughs> so with those few words of introduction, may I now present our speaker for this evening, Professor Trevor Ferguson. Okay, so here is our mouse. So th thank you very much, Marshall. Um, glad you didn't try to find any other more interesting stories to tell. <laughs> um, so let me um, recognize the key persons here. So Deputy Principal, um, Dr. Tomlin Paul, Dean, um, Professor Minerva Thame, um, Marshall, well, director <laughs> for the um, Caribbean Institute for Health Research. Um, Professor Wilkes, um, certainly delighted to have you and to be challenged again <laughs> by your, your remarks. And of course, my family, um, Keshawn and my wife, Sean Michael, my son, my daughter is in Canada, so she is online joining, and my um, parents are here, my sister Nadine, and um, you'll see photos of my other sisters um, in a little while. Um, also to welcome and to recognize um, Bishop Devon Brown, who is the presiding bishop for the Bethel Apostolic Churches in Jamaica, and other members of the church community who are online, all the care family, um, Oh, I miss um, Dr. Williams, uh, Dr. Nadine Williams, Minister of Health, and um, Dr. Grant from the Ministry of Health, and other members. I see several of our junior faculty members here, um, Professor Aiken, of course, and just about all those who are present in person or online. It certainly is a pleasure to be here. I'm delighted to have you. And I certainly would like to thank you for being here and also to thank the university for providing this opportunity for me to learn, develop, and if I may say so myself, excel. So um, let's see if we can find the presentation. This mouse is hiding, okay. <laughs> All right, so let's get going. All right, 
and I think you're seeing the correct screen. So this afternoon, I'm going to be talking about um, the determinants of blood pressure across the life course, and of course, looking at lessons that I have learned from a journey in hypertension research. And um, as is traditional, I will begin with a little bit of my road to academic medicine. How did I get here? And um, you got a few snippets from um, Professor Wilkes and um, Professor Tuller Reed. Um, fortunately, I have a few pictures to support <laughs> the, the story, so it won't be just the same story that they told. But the pillars upon which my academic journey has been built really has been my family, the church, and a strong education. So let's look a little bit at what we have got. So the journey starts with my family. My parents, um, Trevor T. Ferguson, so not quite the junior marshal. <laughs> Or, well, so I'm not quite junior, so I, that's why you always see me write Trevor S. So he's Trevor T, I'm Trevor S. Uh, my mom, um, Etris Ferguson, and fortunate or unfortunate, I have three sisters. Um, Nadine, the youngest, is here uh, with us in person. The others are overseas, Diana and Novlet. And um, this is, picture is from my parents' 50th wedding anniversary. This one is from my eldest sister's high school graduation. You can see we were very small at that time. Um, so my parents and the family provided a nurturing environment that was based on sound Christian principles with a strong emphasis on education. Um, we weren't well-to-do in any way, but one thing was sure that when time for school was there, all my books were made available, and you were going to learn, and everything that was required for support was provided. So certainly want to give thanks for parents who saw the value of education. Now, the new... <laughs> The nuclear family, uh, my wife Kashana, and children Sean Michael and Kristen, and they have put up with, I guess, all the business and the extra hard work that sometimes made me unavailable. So um, thank you very much. Um, Kesh certainly has shouldered much more than her fair share of parental responsibilities. I don't know if the children would have survived very well if it were me only. So I really want to thank her for her support for me and also for the children. Okay. Then, um, as mentioned, church has been a critical part of my life. It all started or the, in my childhood years at the Beulah Pentecostal Temple in Olympic Gardens. We traveled on the bus from Spanish Town to Kingston pretty much every Sunday and at other times as required. And um, there I learned a lot about the Bible, a lot about God and a strong Christian foundation that solidified my faith. So I'm really grateful for that experience and that exposure, and a lot of what I am today goes back to those early upbringing. I have to mention the University and College's Apostolic Ministry, UCAM. This was our campus ministry group that provided a lot of support while I was here as a medical student on campus. Social support, friendships, and so much more. So UCAM is a really critical component of my life. I mentioned the Pentecostal Sanctuary, previously North Kingston Sanctuary, um, in the Grand Spen community where I served for 10 years. And there I learned principles of leadership, having been thrust into part of the leadership team at a very young age. And, um, but I grew a lot from that experience. 
and currently at the Bethel United Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic, where I'd say that I've learned more service. So it's time to give back, to contribute, and to ensure that you do whatever you can to help others in their Christian journey. So education. Um, three schools pictured here. I had to mention Greendale Basic School. Most persons don't talk about basic school, but it was a very, very important foundation. And I, I, there was a bit of um, chatter on a WhatsApp group about things that happened at basic school that I don't remember, but clearly there were signs from then. Spanish Town Primary School provided a very strong basis of, for learning and a lot of um, very important principles. But I'd probably focus a lot on St. Jago High School because that institution, I believe, more than any other, contributed to who I am today in this academic journey. So featured on this slide, we have in the um, top right-hand corner, Mr. Victor Edwards. He was the principal of St. Jago High School when I um, was a student there. And he was a no-nonsense person, but really instilled in us confidence. We were the non-town school, but we were taught and believed that we could outperform any school under any circumstances, and we took them on and did sufficiently well. I have to also mention uh, Mrs. Murray. Mrs. Murray was my third, well, my chemistry teacher from third to sixth form, so five years. And a lot also can be traced back to her. So when she arrived in third form with chemistry, came to class with only her chalk. But she was so impressive that I fell in love with chemistry. And that created a new trajectory um, that really demonstrated excellence. We really benefited from teachers like that, and I want to laud her memory. Uh, Marshall mentioned schools challenge and debates, so competition, excitement, lots of things, but it was part of the journey. Then medical school. Now medical school was interesting, challenging, and I, I won't say a lot, because um, time would not allow us, but I want to mention the support from the Jamaica Centenary Scholarship, which certainly provided the um, financial assistance needed to complete university education. Irving Hall, I don't know if there are any Irvingites here, but <laughs> all right, great, provided camaraderie, fellowship, and really a good grounding in the university setting. And then UCAM, as previously mentioned. After university, it was off to Spanish Town Hospital. Um, four and a half years, internship, casualty, internal medicine, and there I learned a lot of clinical skills, the importance of caring for patients, interacting with patients in a really positive way, and being able to respect everybody. And I must um, mention the two internal medicine consultants I served under Dr. Bertram Brownie and Dr. Alric Campbell really inspired and demonstrated care way beyond self. Then came residency. And uh, let's say it was interesting and challenging. Surviving internal medicine residency is no mean feat. And um, I believe that almost everyone has a quit day. <laughs> So I distinctly remember my quit day when after diabetes clinic and going back to the ward and you're leaving the hospital at 8 o'clock and I was sure I wasn't going to do internal medicine anymore. So I called my sister, told her my plans, I was going to switch to something like microbiology or something like that. But somehow after a good night's sleep and you know the fact that you had an option, <laughs> I persevered and continued. And, um, well, after DM1, spent a few months at TMRI. At that time, I really went to 
quote-unquote escape. You wanted a place that was not as stressful. But I learned a lot of principles. Um, Lincoln Sarge and Professor Wilkes were the persons that I worked with closely at the time and um, developed my initial interest in epidemiology and developed my first um, project idea about diabetic foot complications. But all of that time, the plan was endocrinology, as Michael said. But I want to mention a few persons who really stood out during the internal medicine program. Professor Charles Denbo of blessed memory, Dr. Orrin Barrow, certainly um, inspired, challenged. Certainly with Dr. Barrow, you knew that you could not slack off at any time. So we really learned a lot, and those of us who had the exposure um, to him um, benefited greatly. Um, Professor Rosemary Wright Pasco, who was our chief endocrinologist at the time, um, Professor Barton, and Professor Wills, who though focused at the time at TMRI, came to do rounds in September of every month. And I distinctly remember the emphasis on critical thinking. So we had to learn how to think if you're going to work with Professor Wilkes. So thankfully, I survived. <laughs> and then when internal medicine residency was over, a short stint as chief resident, and then on to care, TMRI at the time. And I had to give persons their individual pictures because um, this really represented a I don't know if it's a lifetime, but it's almost 20 years <laughs> of learning, training, inspiration, and support. So um, at CARE, I would have started with the, as a research fellow, did my master's in epidemiology by distance with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, then went on afterwards to do the PhD in epidemiology. But the persons featured here were critical at all levels. So Professor Wilkes was my main academic mentor, and I think some persons also said protector. <laughs> so um, certainly he provided the atmosphere, the encouragement, and the challenge for excellence. Now, Marshall and I shared office during those early years, and therefore, he was my sounding board for every idea. And of course, one of the things that Marshall found a way to make every idea more complicated. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have some a nice little project that I was, do, was, was going to do, and Marshall would now add this and subtract this, and after a while, it was a lot more work. But thanks, Marshall, I think they became better. <laughs> because of your insistence. And um, Dr. Novi Younger, I'm not seeing Novi. Novi, are you here? Oh, she's right at the back, right. The statistician. Um, I would have sat for hours and hours and hours in her office learning statistics, going through complex analyses, discovering things, figuring them out together, but I would not have achieved even a quarter of what I have achieved if it hadn't been for the support from, from Novi. So thanks, Novi. Hats off. <laughs> and of course, if I went on in details on everybody, then we would have trouble. So the other persons I'll just mention by name, and then we'll probably move on very quickly. Um, Professor Terence Forrester, who was the director of TMRI at the time, certainly provided inspiration and direction. Professor Susan Walker, who was the lead for the um, Child Development Research um, Group and their world-leading um, intervention program, certainly was a strong motivation as to what could be achieved. Michael Boyne and Marvin Reed were always very good sounding boards and helped to guide me along the way. And Colin McKenzie, who unfortunately no longer with us, um, very insightful and always had critical questions. So we have to 
um, you know, salute his effort. Now, Kennedy Cruikshank, um, featured here, is included in this list. He did not belong to CARE, but he was there often enough that we would think that he is CARE. <laughs> and one thing I would say that um, I remember, this was probably 2011 or thereabouts, he marched into my office and then, you know, declared, how are you going to be a professor in epidemiology without a PhD? So I was trying to avoid doing the PhD. Needless to say, well, he somehow saw a professor in epidemiology from then. I registered in the PhD program the year after. So thanks, Kennedy, for marching into my office. And then um, Christine Powell, who is here, thanks, Christine, and Susan Chang um, Lopez as our other colleagues in the unit. And I mentioned um, Henry Fraser, who was the director of the then CDRC in Barbados, um, also provided encouragement along the way. Um, as Professor Wills would have mentioned, I can consider myself a product of the University of the West Indies that m the majority of my training has been local. So while I did the um, the masters with University of London. I was very much here and learning from Marshall and Prof. Wilkes and so forth while doing the, um, the MS in epidemiology. Did have a, some international exposure, but I really want to credit the UWI for producing um, you know, excellent researchers. So here featured um, short stints at the Harvard University, King's College London, Johns Hopkins, and um, the American Heart Association in their 10-year cardiology course, or cardiovascular epic course, in Tao City, California. So that's the long intro to all those who helped along the journey, those whose names were called, and the numerous other members of the team who were there, really want to thank you. Um, I see Monica, um, Colette, and um, the, where's my brain going? <laughs> and Jennifer, along with others who were there from the very outset and um, provided all the support. So thank you very much, and we do salute you for the efforts that you have made. All right, so after all of that, what did I really learn? And I want to focus the rest of this talk on three sections. A very brief overview of hypertension and its importance to public health. Key lessons learned from my research on hypertension and the implications of these findings for policy and practice and projections for future research. So just last Tuesday, the World Health Organization published a report the, on the global, a global report on hypertension dubbed the race against a silent killer. And in this report, they point out that high blood pressure is a global public health problem. 1.3 billion persons currently living with hypertension works out to approximately one in three adults. Nearly half are unaware of the condition, and only one in five are controlled. High blood pressure is responsible for almost 11 million deaths annually. So clearly, this is an important problem that we need to have a good understanding of. Now, high blood pressure is important because there are several adverse effects, and we are quite familiar with most of these, including um, cardiovascular disease, such as stroke and heart attack, may also result in heart failure, visual loss, chronic kidney disease and kidney failure, which is one of the major uh, manifestations within our population and really needs um, more study. And just for those who would not remember, there is also an association with sexual dysfunction. So often the men blame the medications, but it's more the disease that's causing the problem. Now, very important is that the report points to a solution, so it's not all doom and gloom. If we're able to improve blood pressure control to greater than 50%, 
we could avert seven to six million, cardio, um, million cardiovascular deaths, 120 million strokes, 79 million myocardial infarctions, that's heart attack, and 17 million cases of heart failure between 2023 and 2050. So certainly a lot can be achieved and we certainly need to get our hands to the wheel. What about the situation in Jamaica? And this is a summary report from the, um, the WHO Global Report and they do individual country profiles and this is a bit of what is said concerning Jamaica. So the age standardized prevalence for hypertension, that is a proportion of the population, 30 to 79 years old with high blood pressure for Jamaica is 46%. And important to note that this is significantly higher than the global average, which is 33%. So we have a much larger blood pressure problem than the rest of the world. Also very concerning is that of the persons with high blood pressure, only 65% are diagnosed, 51% are on treatment, and only 19% are controlled. So again, there is a lot to be done. Now for this slide, I wanted to highlight that there is a linear relationship between blood pressure and cardiovascular disease risk. So the actual designation of hypertension is somewhat arbitrary. But the adverse effects of elevated blood pressure is not limited to those who are diagnosed as hypertension, but even those whose blood pressures are below the levels considered um, hypertension, there is um, significant risk. And this slide, which shows um, data from a large meta-analysis published in 2002, um, showed that the risk of um, cardiovascular disease doubled for every 20 millimeters rise in systolic blood pressure and every 10 millimeters rise in diastolic blood pressure. And this effect was seen down to as low as systolic blood pressures of 115 millimeters of mercury or diastolic blood pressures of 17 five millimeters of mercury. So we should not be only concerned about those in the upper ends of the spectrum, but there's also some importance for those whose blood pressures are mildly elevated, if you want to use that term. So what have we been doing here at the Epidemiology Research Unit? So we have conducted research looking at hypertension prevalence. We've looked at prehypertension, which we'll talk about in a little while. Several determinants of hypertension, including um, the behavioral determinants, biological determinants, and social determinants. We have also looked at treatment strategies and participated in treatment guidelines. So for the next um, few slides, I'm going to synthesize um, a lot of what we have learned into seven key statements or seven key lessons um, from hypertension research and support that with some evidence. So firstly, one of the things that we have found is that elevated blood pressure, and or we could use the term prehypertension, is not only a problem of older persons, but is also common among youth. And we look at this slide, which presents data from my first original um, research paper looking at the prevalence of prehypertension in Jamaica and its relationship to cardiovascular disease. Um, risk factors, and this was from the Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey 1, which com was completed between 2000 and 2001. And this is looking at the prevalence of prehypertension, so that's the percentage of the population who had blood pressures that were higher than normal, so normal blood pressures less than 120 over 80, and less than would be classified as hypertension, which would be 140 over 90. And what was striking is that the prevalence of prehypertension was very high among the younger persons. So whereas we have traditionally known that the, the prevalence of hypertension increases significantly with age, here we were seeing that among the young persons, large proportions had prehypertension. So to look at a few of the specifics, among men, 
In the 15 to 24 age group, 35% were classified as prehypertension, and almost 40% among those um, 25 to 34. And then the women were not far behind, 18% in the 15 to 24 age group, almost 30% in the um, 25 to 34 age group. So certainly this suggests that we have to pay attention to blood pressure in our younger population as well. Now, we sought to see whether or not this was, would be borne out in other studies, so we looked at this in two other um, research projects that we had going at the time. So firstly, the Jamaica Youth Risk and Resilience and Behavior Survey that looked at persons between the ages of 15 to 19 years. And when we looked at this, we found that 29% of those had prehypertension. And note here, this is now 15 to 19 years. 35% among the males and 24% among the females. And in another study, the 1986 birth cohort, which I'll say a bit more about in a little while, we also found that 20% had um, prehypertension, again, 29% among the males and 13% among the females. So clearly, we have a problem with elevated blood pressure among our younger population, and that's something that we will need to pay some attention to. We were also able to demonstrate that prehypertension is associated with other cardiovascular disease risk factors and an increase in the risk for progression to hypertension. So in this slide, what we look at is the proportion of persons with various risk factors, obesity, high cholesterol, diabetes, and also those who had a clustering of risk factors, so greater than or equal to three risk factors, and looked at the percentages according to um, blood pressure category. So clearly we can see in the green bars that those with normal blood pressure had the lowest um, prevalence for these conditions. Those with prehypertension had higher prevalence of obesity, higher prevalence of high cholesterol, and higher prevalence of diabetes, and were more likely to have three or more risk factors. Of course, those with hypertension were significantly higher, but that we probably already know. So the issue is that we also need to take into consideration that these persons may be at higher risk than we would normally think, and therefore need um, some focus attention. This is the same information for women, and the pattern is pretty much the same. So we also wanted to explore whether persons with prehypertension were at higher risk of progression to hypertension. So we took the opportunity to look at this in the Spanish Town Cohort Study, which had been started initially in the 1992 to 1993 period and had follow-up data up to about 1998. So we looked at persons who had normal blood pressure or prehypertension at baseline and looked at how many of those progressed to hypertension over an average four-year period. And what we were able to show is that those with prehypertension were three times more likely to progress to hypertension within that four-year period, taking into consideration the other risk factors such as um, body mass in their sex, diabetes, and age. So persons with prehypertension were at significantly higher risk of progression to hypertension, therefore, again, would be considered a special risk group. So that's lesson number two. Lesson number three, we looked at early life factors and, and essentially, so early life factors including birth weight and maternal socioeconomic circumstances influences blood pressure in young adulthood. And this was um, from the first research project that I was able to supervise. And when I started at Care, Prof. Wilkes assigned me as a project coordinator for this 1986 birth cohort study. Very fresh to research, didn't know very much. But with some guidance, we were able to succeed. And from this study, 
the 1986 birth cohort, which was a follow-up study. The participants were from the Jamaica Perinatal Mortality Survey, who were born in September or October of 1986. And we followed them up in between 2005 and 2007, and did various measurements. We obtained the birth weight data from the perinatal mortality survey and, of course, blood pressure measured in the um, 2005 to 2007 period. And what we were able to demonstrate is that birth weight had a significant impact on blood pressure at age 18 to 20 years. So for every one standard deviation unit increase in birth weight, systolic blood pressure was 1.2 millimeters of mercury lower among males and 1.3 millimeters of mercury lower among females. And this was independent of other factors such as current age, body mass index, the current height, mother's age at the child's birth, or the mother's occupation. Now, looking at this slide, it shows the relationship between um, blood pressure and birth weight stratified according to, um, to the mother's occupation status. And as we can see from the slope of the curve, that there is this inverse relationship between birth weight and blood pressure. So those with higher birth weights up at this end um, had lower blood pressures than those with lower birth weights. But what we were also able to demonstrate that the lowest pressures were among those whose mothers had skilled or highly skilled occupation. And for mothers who were um, either semi-skilled or unskilled housewives or unemployed, on average, there was a three to four millimeters higher systolic blood pressure. This was um, significant for the men. We saw similar relationships in the women, but not quite achieving statistical significance. But again, emphasizing that early life socioeconomic circumstances influenced blood pressure. Now, not only did the early life cir social circumstances, but factors related to postnatal growth. And therefore, we were able to now demonstrate in, other in another study that the rate of growth and change or gain in weight in childhood also influences um, blood pressure. And this one, um, Professor Thame will remember very well. Um, she was one of the lead investigators in the Vulnerable Windows cohort study, where they recruited um, pregnant women um, during pregnancy and then followed the offspring from, well, actually from the intrauterine period up to um, about age 21. And we were able to look at data from this study um, looking at their growth after birth and relating that to their blood pressures between the ages of 15 and 21 years. And what we were able to show is that the, those who had faster linear growth in the early um, period, um, zero to six months, on average or for each standard deviation increase in the rate of growth had a one millimeter of mercury higher um, systolic blood pressure. Also, those who had higher um, or faster increase in BMI um, from ages six months up to age 15 years were also, also had higher systolic blood pressure. So both the rate of growth in early childhood as well as the rate of increase in adiposity in later childhood or, um, influenced blood pressure. And of course, this will point us to targets that we can look at as I will point out as we come towards the end. So key message number five, obesity, high glucose and measures of insulin resistance were associated with elevated blood pressure in young adults. And for this, we went back to the 1986 birth cohort and did at this time a cross-sectional analysis looking at characteristics when they were 18 to 20 years old and see what characteristics were associated with, with blood pressure at the time. To make it very short and simple, uh, what we were able to demonstrate that among males, those who were obese had a ninefold increase in the odds or in the relative risk of having um, elevated blood pressure or hypertension. 
those with high glucose in the upper 20% of the glucose range had a twofold increase in um, the relative risk for elevated blood pressure or hypertension. And for women or, or the females, high triglycerides and insulin resistance were associated with a twofold increase in the risk of elevated blood pressure or hypertension. So we also thought it important to look at social factors. And we were able to demonstrate in various studies that um, social factors, including educational attainment and neighborhood socioeconomic status, were associated with blood pressure in both adults and youth. So for this next study, we did what is called a pooled analysis, where we took data from three studies, the 1986 birth cohort, which we had previously mentioned, the Jamaica Youth Risk and Resilience Behavior Survey, and the, um, those between 15 to 24 years old in the Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey 2007 to 2008. And we studied over 2,000 um, participants. And what we were able to demonstrate using data from the Mona GIS to construct um, community SES variables is that those with higher neighborhood socioeconomic so, um, status had um, lower blood pressure, particularly among the males. There were also some associations among the females, but this was what we describe as a nonlinear association in that the effect sort of changed depending on the um, particular level of the um, socioeconomic status gradient. But clearly showing there's some relationship between your social circumstances and blood pressure. And when we looked at data from the full um, Jamaican Health and Lifestyle Survey 2, um, looking at the role of educational attainment, we were able to show that the age-specific prevalence of hypertension was generally higher among less educated um, women and also among less educated men, but for men, this association was not statistically significant. And our last key message um, from our most recent study, looking at um, salt intake, and we have been able to show that Jamaicans have high levels of sodium intake and low levels of potassium intake, both of which will contribute to a higher prevalence of hypertension. And this paper is currently in press. We expect that it should be published in the next, within the next week or so. And we were able to show, using data from the Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey 3, um, conducted between 2016 and 2017, that mean sodium consumption in Jamaica was approximately 3.6 grams per day, significantly higher than the recommended 2 grams per day for, by the World Health Organization. Similarly, um, mean potassium consumption was only 2.1 grams per day, significantly lower than the 3.5 grams per day um, as recommended by the World Health Organization. So when we look at the, the, the overall prevalence of high sodium consumption, 6 to 7 percent, or two out of three Jamaicans had high sodium consumption, and almost 90 percent had low potassium consumption. So clearly, work to do in this regard. So to summarize the key findings, so elevated blood pressure is more common among youth. Prehypertension is associated with other cardiovascular diseases factors and increased risk of progression to hypertension. Lower um, weight and maternal socioeconomic status at birth are associated with higher blood pressure at 18 to 20 years. Faster linear growth and, and um, faster increase in BMI in childhood are associated with higher blood pressure. Obesity and insulin resistance are associated with elevated blood pressure in young adults, and lower socioeconomic status is associated with higher blood pressure in both youth and adults. And Jamaicans have too much salt and not enough potassium. So what are the policy implications? Because of course, it's one thing to find nice findings and publish papers. What are the policy implications? And um, so what are, 
So I've just highlighted specific policy actions related to each of these key findings. So with the increased blood pressure in youth, really point that we need to be screening for hypertension in all age groups with adequate emphasis on youth, and I'd also include children here. We don't have the data for children just yet. Um, I see Dr. Harrison here, they did a study on the 10 to 14 years old, so we'll be able to look at that data um, soon. But looking at blood pressure in children is something that we will now also need to, to take into consideration. Given the association between prehypertension and other cardiovascular disease risk factors and increased risk of progression to hypertension, for persons who we see who are in this category, we need to ensure that we're screening for risk factors. So the person who comes into your office as a, uh, for clinicians with a blood pressure of 125 over 85, you should be screening for high cholesterol, checking their weights, and ensuring that you're taking the necessary steps to reduce their cardiovascular risk and institute measures to reduce the, um, pro the progression to hypertension. With regards to low birth weight and low maternal socioeconomic status, it's important that we emphasize improved nutrition for women of childbearing age and improving SES for women and men, of course. So we really need to look at this. And there have been studies that have looked at nutritional interventions in women of childbearing age and have shown significant benefits to the offspring. Of course, with the faster growth leading to increased blood pressure, the focus there would really be on trying to prevent childhood obesity. And there's there is need for quite a bit more research in that area as well. Again, with obesity and insulin resistance, we need to focus on re reducing obesity. So that's a challenge. Uh, one of the things I say in my clinical practice is that it, it's a lot easier to treat the blood pressure and the diabetes than to treat the obesity. But we have to find the solutions. And given the association between low socioeconomic status and increased blood pressure, we need to look at improving socioeconomic conditions overall. So job creation, inner city renewal, stress reduction, overall improvement, improved development, while of course preserving the environment, et cetera, is gonna be critical to us having a healthier Jamaica. And the issue with, with regarding to sodium intake and potassium intake, emphasis on healthy diets, reduced consumption of processed foods, reduced salt in home and restaurant foods, um, product reformulation, and the National Sodium Reduction Program. So some of these things are being done to various extents. As mentioned, I work with the Minister of Health as part of the NCD committee. Um, but of course, there is still a lot more to be done. So what are some of the current um, efforts that we're looking at? Um, the CAT study is one response to the challenge. Um, this study is led by uh, Marshall, and we are working with collaborators in um, Tulane University in New Orleans and um, the University of San Danter, I hope I got that name correct, from Colombia. And the objective of this project is to test the implementation and effectiveness outcomes of implementing and scaling up a team-based strategy for hypertension control in Jamaica and Colombia. And what this really focuses on is standardized protocols involving multiple members of the healthcare team, um, patient empowerment in terms of health coaching, um, teaching home blood pressure monitoring, and so on. What we hope to demonstrate is that that approach is feasible and effective, and of course, to be able to scale that up at present, we are working in 20 clinics to make this our overall national effort. Uh, we mentioned the SALT um, project, so the Jamaica SALT Consumption Knowledge Attitudes and Practices um, study, and I see some members of my research team um, are here. Hi, Shireen. <laughs> all right, we have been in the field and at it, and we are almost at the end of our data collection. 
So this is a collaborative research project between the Carbon Institute of Health Research the Ministry and the Ministry of Health and Wellness and funded by the National Health Fund. And we're aiming to collect baseline data on soil consumption, some of which we have already done and published. Um, we're looking at salt content in food sold in restaurants, although the restaurant people are not so happy to talk to us. We are also evaluating the knowledge, attitudes, and practices of Jamaicans regarding salt consumption, and we will use this data, hopefully, to develop um, policy recommendations as to how we can reduce salt consumption and improve health. We've also been working with the Ministry of Health and Wellness in developing guidelines for hypertension, and we should be able to complete the advanced draft by the end of this year. So hopefully sometime early next year, we will have new guidelines for the management of hypertension. And with the implementation of these guidelines, we look forward to improved care and improved control. So what about the future? Um, we mentioned a couple of the things, so we definitely would want to succeed with the CAT study and then scale this up to a national level and beyond. Um, we can also look at the WHO Hearts program, which has several similarities to what we're doing in the CAT study. Um, definitely would like to work on the national sodium reduction strategy and policy. Um, we have been thinking about and trying to conceptualize a salt substitution trial, and what this would do is that we would um, replace regular table salt with a low sodium salt substitute for persons to use in their general meal preparations, um, both at home and in, um, in restaurants, etc. And hopefully that has been shown to reduce um, blood pressure in several countries. We want to do additional work on the social determinants of um, adverse outcomes in hypertension and develop models to estimate the effect of these interventions because one of the things that we will need to do is to be able to convince our governments that there is an economic benefit for a lot of these policy initiatives that we would be recommending. And I put this up as an aspirational goal. Uh, my wife challenged me on this the other day, but I'm putting it up. <laughs> so, as part of the WHO report, they have looked at what can we do in the Jamaican situation. If we were to improve blood pressure control by to 50%, we could save 11,000 deaths by 2040. And if we could increase it to 70%, it would be even better. So I'm gonna put on the table that I'm envisioning that we will improve control rates to 70% by 2040, and thus save a lot more than 11,000 lives. Thank you very much. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> um. I think you better keep that slide up there. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think you can say that you have not been schooled by Professor Ferguson this evening. You know, Trevor, before we have a few words of, for, I mean, a, a few moments for discussion, Mark Twain once said that universe is a place where the professor lecture notes go straight to the students' lecture notes without passing through the brains of either. <laughs> but I know that's not true tonight, because I know you thought deeply about it, and I know your audience learned well. So I want to thank you for this very illuminating talk. And I'm just going to open up just for a few moments of if there's any discussion. And, and I don't know if our IT friends might also, if there's any um, comments that persons may have also wished to, uh, to bring up. So just opening up, if there's anyone here who wanted to ask any um, or make any comments. And um, Marshall, uh, was, was that your hand starting to go up? 
<laughs> Don't try to make things more complicated. I had a question too that could make things more complicated. But, but why don't you go as the opening batsman, as Professor Wilkes would like to say? Go. All right. Congratulations, um, Professor Ferguson. Um, one of my questions was really looking at the issue of um, the differences that were seen in, in prehypertension prevalence between the young persons, males and females, and I was wondering what you might postulate as some reasons why it may be more common in boys and whether this could in some way be related to some social circumstances. Yeah, so um, it probably is a mix of both. So there are social circumstances, including certain stressors, et cetera, that um, the males would be exposed to a little bit more than females. But it's, a lot has to do with the overall biology um, related to the hormonal um, influences, et cetera. Um, so in practice, we tend to see a lot of young women with lower blood pressures, but you tend not to see that very much in the, old, in the males. So um, what will happen is, of course, these over time will progress. So I think it's, I don't know if we have the exact cause at this point in time, but it's probably a mixture of the biological influences, um, but some social factors may be um, relevant as well. And we certainly need to find ways to reduce stress in our boys. Patrice is coming, but I want to have a little quick follow-up question also too, to help make things complicated for Marsha. <laughs> there was some data out of Spanish town some years ago with the Spanish town cohort which seemed to suggest that blood pressure is more tightly related to lean mass and not fat mass. And many of the boys may also have more lean mass. So I wondered, one, could some of that effect be also a body composition effect? And we could always talk about it afterwards. And the other thing I want to ask, I noticed your association with, um, with young women for insulin resistance and triglycerides, which tends to be a salt sensitive indicator. Is there any indication that salt reduction in women would be stronger than for men? Um, I can't recall seeing specific studies comparing the women versus men for salt reduction, but we definitely know within our context, um, the sodium reduction trial, which was led uh, by Professor Forrest, that we were able to show that reducing sodium um, was able to lower blood pressure in um, our populations and also demonstrated in Nigeria as well. So salt reduction is definitely a strategy to reduce blood pressure in our population, certainly something that we will need to explore and implement on a much larger scale. Thank you. And then Dr. Francis Emmanuel is coming to the front. Good afternoon, Professor Ferguson. Thanks for a very informative presentation. My question had to do with um, the way blood pressure is measured for these studies in terms of um, assessing control and also making the diagnosis. A lot of patients, I'm sure, come to you and they tell you, at home, my blood pressure is 120 over 70, but when I come to you in the office, it's 140 over 90. What is your take on white coat hypertension? And do you believe if the um, availability of ambulatory blood pressure monitoring was more widespread and less, less expensive, that your findings would have changed in any way? So, all right, thank you very much. That's a very important um, question. So the measurement procedures for our surveys um, is very standardized and um, in terms of what the extent to which that correlates with, um, say, ambulatory blood pressure has never formally been studied. One of the things, though, is that certainly for the national surveys, the blood pressures are actually taken by, for the most part in the participant's home environment. So they're not in a clinical environment, but of course there is a third party taking the blood pressure, which will have an effect. Um, so the recommendations now, which will come up as part of our guidelines, is that ambulatory blood pressure is recommended um, for the confirmation of the diagnosis of hypertension. So that is something that we will need to look into. But the screening procedures usually start with the, the um, clinic blood pressure monitoring or 
the measurements as done in our studies using standardized procedures, which would make a large effort to reduce bias. Um, so it's not foolproof, but it's the measures that, and it's the same measures that are used elsewhere. So um, in terms of what we are seeing, the high prevalence in Jamaica compared to others is, um, is, is not likely to be incorrect. Now, just to say, and this is an observation, um, Michael and, some, and Prof. Wilkes would also be, be very familiar with this. In the 1990s, um, Richard Cooper and others looked at this, the study of blood pressure across the African diaspora and was able to show a clear gradient with the lowest blood pressures in Africa, moderate blood pressures in the Caribbean, and highest blood pressures in the US. One of the things I've done in my hypertension lectures is to actually show how that has completely reversed in, the, in over a 20-year period, so that the highest blood pressures now are actually in Africa, a middle-level blood pressure in Jamaica, and the lowest in the US. And I think that has to do with some of the environmental changes. It may be related to a higher exposure to processed foods, high salt foods, et cetera. But it's not just genetic, because when you're looking at persons with the same genetic pool, whereas we had a gradient from east to west um, 20 years ago, that has completely reversed um, in, in more recent times. Michael. <laughs> um, I, just looking on the list online, mostly uh, lots of congratulations, Trevor, class of 1995, bigging you up, and some others. I don't see many in terms of other sort of questions. But any other question from, uh, here's one more. Brave soul coming to the front, very good. Yeah, you could come. Congratulations, Professor Ferguson. And I hope to help with the advanced work on the SES section of hypertension. But I thought of asking, and my question is regarding screening. And you mentioned the prehypertension among the obese, um, and it's the youth. So I was wondering, do you intend to do some work with that in terms of our young people don't really interact with the health system most times until they're in the 25 and over, and if they're ill. So would you advise, seeing that we have a high rate of obesity, childhood obesity, would you give some advice with regards to screening at the age in which if you have an obese child, then you can begin to screen for prehypertensive symptoms? So um, with that, we definitely will recommend screening for all adults. So there's clear evidence for adults 18 years and older. Um, based on data here from the um, youth risk survey and the early, the younger persons in the national surveys, certainly from 15 up there is um, need for screening. And we will learn soon enough among the, what's recommended among the children. So definitely all adults should be screened for blood pressure annually. And um, that's something that we will need to get out there. Of course, the Ministry of Health has national screening guidelines, which um, we will you know, ensure that is promoted as much as possible. Um, when the hypertension guidelines are out, screening will be part of the recommendations as well. And also, just to mention other efforts through the Ministry of Health, the Know Your Numbers campaign, which really emphasizes screening for high blood pressure, high cholesterol, checking your body weight, and so on. So what really is needed is a big culture change. So today we're focused on blood pressure, but obesity, diabetes, high cholesterol are also important, and we will definitely need to improve um, on our screening, but not only to screen, but we will need to have the policy initiatives that makes life healthier. So our food supply, um, uh, in terms of what is it is available to eat, must be healthier, and to make it sufficiently easy to have physical activity, more green spaces, and this is 
my kind of personal opinion, we need a big effort on portion sizes. It's not in any of the literature, but my personal observation is that if we could work on portion sizes, we could solve half the problem. So, but that's something that we'll need to research. But most places you go, you get much too much food. And we need to... <laughs> We need to reduce the plate sizes <laughs> and reduce the portion sizes. <laughs> and I think that will make a big difference. <laughs> uh, Ma so no more big food. Marshall? Yeah, starting tomorrow. <laughs> oh, my question is really just around something that um, Dr. Francis Emanuel had mentioned, which is really the issue of standardized blood pressure measurement. And that's been one of the big issues that we're dealing with in CATCH. And what we have noticed so far from the patients we have seen, and I know we have spoken about it, but I don't know if you have any other ideas in retrospect, is that the levels of control are not um, consistent with what we would see from the international literature, say, for instance, audit, and have discovered that a lot of the Poor control is really due to poor measurement techniques. I don't know if you want to address that also as one of the big pushes that the ministry should consider. Yeah. So, so certainly we will need to analyze the data and really present that. So what Marshall is mentioning is that in preliminary findings from the CAT study, we're trying to find persons with uncontrolled hypertension, which would be a clinic blood pressure greater than 130 over 80. And when we actually go into the clinics and use a standard blood pressure measurements using the automated devices, um, we find that the level of the, the proportion of persons with uncontrolled are much lower than we would have expected. So what it means is that part of the problem is that when patients come to the clinic, the blood pressure measurement procedure is inadequate, and therefore people are classified as having higher blood pressures than their true values. And of course, that goes to the importance of proper measurement. Now, our challenge is that those machines are more expensive, but when we look at it, the cost-benefit analysis, the amount of effort that we spend in procuring additional drugs um, may be offset by having um, more emphasis placed on measurement procedures. And of course, also, as um, Dr. Emanuel mentioned, the issue of home blood pressure monitoring and ambulatory blood pressure monitoring, all of which will come out as part of our recommendation in our guidelines and um, moving the, 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 the blood pressure measurement and assessment forward into the 21st century, if you want to put it that way. Well, in ter <laughs> so Marshall is asking who can measure blood pressure. So, um, of course, anybody who is properly trained, so the most important thing is the training. So it's not so much the doctor or the nurse, it is really the training in terms of appropriate measurement, following the standardized procedures and following the protocol. And it is also thought that there's less bias sometimes in some of the more junior level staff in doing the blood pressure measurements um, as opposed to when the clinicians are doing those measurements. So that's another area that we will need to further explore. Thank you, Trevor. Don't go anywhere. We're going to just take very quickly one or two things that are online, not, not to neglect our online audience. And I think there was one further up. Um, so we're just going to take it maybe as short things as we just wanted, because uh, we do have to wrap up. Uh, congratulations, Professor Ferguson. Thank you for a very palatable for the non-medical persons and gripping reminder of the quiet pandemic in Jamaica. You mentioned the need for more investigation of social determinants of hypertension and prehypertension. But is there space for integration with social sciences to guide public policy, especially with the knowledge that NCDs are some of the most expensive health issues? So I guess it's the intersection with the social science. Yeah, well, that is definitely welcome. So there is a whole field of epidemiology called social epidemiology. And um, we have done some work with social sciences. We need to uh, um, expand on that. And um, also the issue of health economists 
um, so in terms of estimating cost, et cetera. So there is a large role for interdisciplinary um, studies. So understanding the social drivers, what are the things that determine behavior um, are also important. And the social scientists will definitely have a better understanding of some of those issues than us um, as um, in terms of medical sciences. And of course, health economics, which is part of social science, is also a very critical component. And if we're going to make the kind of advances that we um, need to make, we're going to have to show the economic benefit of good health. Um, there is, I think it's one of the uh, the declarations we said that the health of our nations is the wealth of our nations, making that nexus between good health and um, economic benefit is also important, and it requires that collaborative effort. And I'm sure um, Prof. Wills will also mention that the very first epidemiology unit had a mix of the social sciences and the health scientists. So we need to strengthen those relationships. So if there's a volunteer, um, send me an email, come by my office, we can talk. <laughs> great, and I think, great, I think that also ties into another question or a comment about how this, the social science can be integrated even into civics education at the school level. So very good point. And just the very last question, there's a couple there about, is it better to have sea salt rather than adenized table salt? There are two questions there for that. Yeah. Any quick so the simple answer is that it's really the amount of sodium that is in the salt. No, so if you're going to have a lot of sea salt, it does make a difference if you have high sodium content. The, it may, some may argue that the crystals are larger, and therefore, you know, if you're using your finger to pinch the salt, you may actually use less. Um, but there isn't a specific advantage between tea, sea salt and the other salts in that regard. The real issue is the total amount of sodium that one consumes, and we need to reduce sodium in any shape or form. Well, Trevor, thank you. So, I mean, I'm sure you're going to be besieged with questions outside afterwards and also email. But, you know, while you were talking, I wrote down that Thomas Edison said, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but will interest his patients in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And I think your talk has helped to illuminate this very same principle. So we are better for having heard your process and what you have shared with us, and we want to thank you kindly for your professorial lecture today. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> Professor Ferguson. And of course, as always, I'm sure your parents taught you is to have good manners, we must say thank you. So we're going to have the vote of thanks now. And we're going to have Dr. Salmon Ferguson, who seems to have some relationship to Professor Trevor Ferguson. But welcome, and thank you for doing the vote of thanks. Thank you, Professor. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It has been an absolute honor to take part in what has truly been a wonderful evening. And also to be asked to give the vote of thanks at this milestone event in the career of Professor Trevor Ferguson. Yes, Professor Boyne, my husband. The greetings and all that has been done, but first of all to you, Professor Bowen. Thank you for your warm welcome and opening remarks and all the other quotes and just about everything that you have said that has truly set the tone for the occasion and for taking us so ably through the program. Thank you. The greetings from Dr. Tomlin Paul, Professor Minerva Thien, and Dr. Nadine Williams highlighted the significance of Professor Ferguson's work within the context of the university, the country, and the wider region, 
which indeed added to the occasion. Thank you. The special remarks by Emeritus Professor Rainford Wilkes added another dimension to our understanding of the work of Professor Ferguson, in particular within the Care uh, Institute. It was greatly appreciated. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Tolreed Marshall, for that informative introduction. And only a colleague as you are could have done it like you did it. Thanks. Thanks has also been extended to Mrs. Smith O'Connor and her team for all their efforts in planning the event and ensuring that things were in order. Ms. Sharian Small, manager of care for support and guidance throughout. Mrs. Hutchinson and team from Cuisine Art for providing refreshments that we will enjoy shortly. Ms. Janelle Williams and team from the Mona Information Technology Services and the Faculty of Medical Sciences IT team for the technical support that has been provided. All other persons who have helped in any way to make this evening a success, including the ushers, yes, who have attended to us ably, thank you. Special thanks to our guest of honor, Professor Trevor Ferguson, for an enlightening presentation that has evoked thought and will prompt action as we support his goal of improving hypertension control rates. Well, it has already begun in our home, using less sodium. Have to get the potassium right. I have to eat some more bananas. Yes. But please join me again in applauding him for his dedication to improving lives through his study and work on hypertension and health-related conditions. Yes, go ahead, go ahead and applaud him. Thank you, thank you. Last but not least, thank you all for being here. Your presence and participation have made this event the success that it has been. Also thanking specially Professor Ferguson's parents, Grandma and Dad, Nadine, his sister, and our son, Sean, who are sharing in this event this evening. I must also specially thank Bishop Devon Brown. Amen. And our other church members, our sisters and brothers and friends from Bethel, and all other persons who have come in a special way to support this event. For those persons who were not able to be with us in person, thank you. There were over 100 persons who were online. Special thank you for joining online via the live stream, including our daughter, Kristen, who is away at school. We want to say thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, again, for a wonderful evening and for all that you have done to make this what it has been. Thank you and have a good rest of the evening. Well, the, thank you so much for the vote of thanks. And um, the last remarks are closing remarks, so I have the mic again. Um, I only want to say a a few, a few things because there are festivities in the sunken garden afterwards. So, but I think this evening has been another feather in the cap for the UWY in its 75th year. And uh, Professor Ferguson has shared his experience in developing his academic pursuits and what is needed to be elevated in the academy. As always my hope, Dean, that these IPLs inspire some bright, ambitious student, some bright, whether undergrad or postgrad, or some early career lecturer to make their mark in science to the betterment of the Jamaican people 
and the wider international community. So Trevor, thanks again for your work. We also thank those who supported you along your journey, and we look forward to hearing more of your work as it progresses, because I agree with the dean that we should have regular lectures, and they don't need to be inaugural, <laughs> but with so much great data and work coming out of this university, we need regular updates. So Trevor, you're going to be coming back also. So everyone, good evening. Safe travels home until we meet yet again at one of these lectures. Have a great evening. All the best, everybody.